All stations, Herc entering dispatch. Control, are we good for release? Back deck, we are good for release. That's work released. All station, Herc, pass the transom. This is an audio slate for dive H2022. UTC time is 1858.55. stations, that's uh, Atlanta and Herc uh, free from the vessel.
control, uh, deck, uh, I'll stop 5-0. You have control. Hello and good morning to everyone. Today we are on dive 2022. We are exploring the canyons of Molokai today. Molokai I E. That I, that last part always gets me. I think both pronunciations are okay. accepted. Yeah. Um. The southern version and then the Hawaiian <laughs> version. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to using our wide field. Um, camera array system again today to get some uh, more photogrammetry footage of our canyon. Uh, we know that we can expect from the last dive that was reported out here to see some corals, some large basalt formations again, a very silty floor, and perhaps a shark or two. There is rumor of uh, the potential of uh, six I'd be skill, okay with that. Six skill sharks. I'd certainly be okay with that. Yeah, so this is just another dive in an, another complex terrain environment, right? Yesterday, the pilots were amazing at flying us around this beautiful coral head. And, yes. And, and, and adapting to the requirements of all the different lighting configurations that, that the, the filming required. It was just, just a great, great dive yesterday. It is. And they've diligently been working on putting those 3D models together so that we can share that with the public and it's quite phenomenal to look at. Yep, so today we're gonna be in this uh, canyon on the north side of Molokai. The, the general kind of ass assessment of the seabed here is there's a lot of silt and runoff from Molokai, mm -hmm. right? Because at one time these canyons were subaerial, right above um, the water and so there's been a lot of erosion that has silted over like the tops of these canyon walls, but the, the, these steep wall faces are still uh, free of sedimentation. And so we're hoping to um, find these large rock outcroppings to look for these columnar basalts again in this area with the hint of the megafauna, the sharks, it seemed like a dive that we couldn't pass up in the hurl team who helped us kind of pick out these top terrain targets for this expedition, yes. we're adamant that this one was a, a spot that we should check out. So I'm looking forward to it. Me too. Me too. Well, I am your science communication fellow. My name is Devin. Uh, when I'm not aboard the Nautilus, I am a sixth grade science teacher in Clarksville, Tennessee. I'm super excited to be here with you guys today as we're coming near the end of this expedition. We have just a few days left. Uh, it's been a phenomenal experience. I've enjoyed every second of it. Um, would encourage anyone uh, that was interested in uh, being a part of an expedition like this, get onto nautiluslive.org, click on to the join section, especially if you're an educator. The outreach that this gives you for your classroom is just a wealth of knowledge and experience that you'll be able to share with students and uh, open doors and interests for them that they did not know exist. Kristen, how are you this morning? I'm, I'm doing well. We might as well start with our back row introduction. <laughs> All right. You're my go-to. Did you notice that, right? I, I did notice that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I am Dr. Kristen Mitchell, and I work for the Office of Naval Research uh, on their education and outreach stuff, um, and also some of the in-house laboratory research that's done at the Office of Naval Research. And on the Nautilus, I'm sitting in the data logger seat. Um, and I, I have to report on I'm the... Giving, I'm giving you a drum roll. I was going to say, I'm, I have to report Today on the... Today we don't do the actual yes. spiel, but now we get <laughs> yes. a little bit of the, the, the information We the get data. to see a uh, 
preview, kind of. So I had a thousand more, app nearly a thousand more applications for both the high school and the uh, undergraduate and graduate programs this year, up from last year. So that was really exciting. Yeah. Um, Do you? So you're hinting that this is the Nautilus bump in I these don't know. numbers. I'm I'm going to say that that's the case because <laughs> clearly it was. Um, I definitely was watching the site tra website traffic while we've been out here, and it definitely was like an uptick. So I, oh, I cool. think that um, not only us talking about it uh, here on the live streams, but also I know the SEFs have been talking in about it yes. in the schools as well. So I think that's really cool. And it's you a, plugged it well. <laughs> it's a great way to spread the word, and um, it's exciting to see that we've had some more applicants, and we'll see uh, how many selections we get this year. It's got to be great for the the Navy too, though, that, that folks, young people who are interested in Nautilus, what Nautilus is doing, uh, are just the type of people that probably would be passionate about the Absolutely. Uh, project or mission in the Navy, you know? Yeah, exactly. And so. with no actual, like, you don't have to be in the military. You can support the Navy and not have to actually enlist. Yep. So that's kind of a cool thing, too. And I don't think when we advertise these programs, we don't always, I'm not always clear on that. And people are like, do I have to go to boot camp? And no, you don't have to. You it is one of those <laughs> things that, that you intuitively know isn't on the table, <laughs> yes. but that you just have to say openly and out loud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've definitely had students come up to me and be like, I don't want to, I don't want to do boot camp. And I'm like, this is, you don't have to. <laughs> should, the website should be like, <laughs> Navy intern, no boot camp, no <laughs> uniform.org right. or yes. whatever, you know. But yeah. This would be right there. Yeah, but the mission is, you know, important. Doing this research, doing all this exploration is something that na the Navy has been doing forever, and it's something that they continue to do. So it's exciting to be able to showcase it. And I, I um, interact with the Nautilus, uh, with the interns during the actual internships. We like to do the um, outreach, the uh, live streams with the Nautilus when they're there because they don't often get out on ships. Yeah. So, you know, that's something that uh, you, even w working in the Navy, it's something that's different. So... Uh, it's awesome too that the Nautilus has its own internships on board. You can come out and actually participate on the ship. So, huge supporter of OET Nautilus. We appreciate so much the Office of Naval Research. Yep. Absolutely. I agree with that for sure. What? Oh, I just had a question oh. come through. A great one. Recommendation letters. I was just gonna say, oh. am I like the extreme close up on? Is that like feet yeah, three that of me was there? that was you. <laughs> Pete, what's going on? You gotta warn me. <laughs> I can pick my nose at any moment. I don't know. Recommendation letters. They wanted to know if it would have been needed to be done by yesterday, but no. if it, just the application process. Application had to be due was due yesterday. The uh, recommenders have another ten days, so those are due okay. on November tenth. So don't worry if your recommendation letters have not gone in yet. Perfect. Um, you, they still your recommenders still have a little bit of time because we right. know that sometimes I know I was looking also last I checked the how many applications were actually finished yesterday at about seven p.m. Eastern time, and it was like the, I got about more than five hundred more in each overnight. Since nice. I checked again this right morning, up to the wire. yeah, the yeah, everyone likes to do it at the last possible second. Yeah, so, yeah. so I gently uh, nudge <laughs> those people that you're needing the recommendations for to just remind them that they have until the 10th of November to help complete your application. But um, for sure, get that in there. Devin, was that a question right now? In the yeah, chat? like literally oh, so right this second, yeah. one minute, two seconds ago. Yeah. So <laughs> somebody was actively that. applied yeah. for the program. Cool. That's, yeah. that's exciting. Well, I think on Ali's shift last night, someone was typing in the chat that they were working on their application while she was listening to the live stream. Nice. <laughs> That's nice. Great. That's great. Um, my turn? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, uh, Jason Fay, I'm uh, serving as expedition leader for, uh, for this trip. Uh, when I'm not on Nautilus, I'm the associate director of the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, which is uh, five... Um, academic and nonprofit institution partnership from the University of New Hampshire, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, URI, my home institution, uh, the University of Southern Mississippi, and of course, the Ocean Exploration Trust. And so we exercise uh, an ocean exploration program for NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration, about $20 million a year worth of awesome exploration activities from laboratory-based projects to education and outreach to 
Uh, about six months of ship time here on Nautilus is all funded through NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration. You stay busy. Uh, uh, so my background as a naval officer, I feel I have a little bit of a, what do they call that? The uh, imposter syndrome oh. working around the brilliant people in these organizations, right? I, didn't, I don't have my PhD, so I act as like a problem solver, program manager, you know, ad administrator. And I'm just really, really appreciative of the brilliant folks that are at the project level that are actually like soldering circuits in some new piece of technology <laughs> yep. or analyzing footage from one of the dives to, to come up with some new insight about the deep ocean that had never been done before. And I'm just very happy that I can like enable those things, you and know, and put my it capacity. all together. Yeah. yeah. That imposter syndrome is real. <laughs> that's a real thing. It, but it's so common. That's the other, you it, think it really like you're is. the only one afflicted, but everybody around you probably is feeling <laughs> I, it in some I way too. I have definitely, I, before we even started this journey and I just went to the training for this, I was like, oh my gosh, how did I get selected for this? This is crazy. And then being here and around all of the brilliant minds that are around here, um, I, I've done nothing but learn from everyone and it's been phenomenal. Yeah. But there have definitely been times when I'm like, wow, I just need to sit back and listen. But that allows you the opportunity to learn too. And um, everyone has been so great about sharing their experiences and the things that they do and really just explaining how things are working. That's uh, given me the opportunity to learn a lot more. I feel like I can talk a little bit more about photogrammetry. Not much when it comes to sitting next to Jonathan, who is not here with us right this moment, but I'm sure will be at some point. But it really has been an amazing experience. But yeah, that's I, I'm very aware of the fact now that that is, yeah. and it, it is a real thing. But you both bring such great experience of your own, like things that I don't do. Like I'm terrible at talking, Devin. I don't know how you've been carrying this conversation with me, sitting over here quietly in the corner this <laughs> whole this, all this time. <laughs> I poke you. Just poke the, hey, Kristen, <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> And also, like naval, exp you know, naval officer experiences. That's not not something I've done. You have way more experience on ships and all that sort of operation stuff that, like, I know nothing about. So I'm just well, happy we've showed up at every dive site. The weather's been decent. Like, <laughs> it really has been nice. The big puzzle pieces have all yeah. come together. <laughs> we haven't. I felt like we did struggle. hit the bottom of the barrel the other day, though, when we started talking about our pets. Yeah, that's true. We were like, yeah. we were really reaching for kind of. We were just we were in the middle of a, a winch issue and just kind of. <laughs> Needed to just fill the voice, but I mean, you know, pets are always a great go-to. I still yeah. think there needs to be a pet on board. Maybe we can get a stuffed pet or something. You know what? That I would see be the, good. I see the interaction going on. Uh, is with, is with slow -mo back there? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> slow is sitting in the seat. Right yeah. the educational <laughs> studio. We have the, the sloth on board, yeah. the stuffed sloth on board. Yeah. The, I, uh, I'm still amazed at how popular that has become for her. Absolutely amazing. Smolo. Slow Mo Love Science. I yeah. believe that's the Instagram uh, account for that. Uh, that sloth has accomplished more things. He's than been all over the place. I, I think he's been more places than I have. <laughs> let's uh, let's weave the front row into our uh, banter here. Oh my feel, gosh, I'd love I to do bad. that. Johan, good morning. Good morning. How's How are going? you this morning? I'm doing good. <laughs> Robert scratches his head. He's like, all right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Go, sorry, Johan, go ahead. Ed. Um, yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Johan Becker. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, right now, I'm the navigator board Nautilus, uh, which means I'm, I'm the map guy. Uh, I kind of look at where our ship is positioned and where the vehicles are underwater and make sure that everything's in a good position so that we can do the operations we want to do. And just keep track of where we're going and our schedule and all that kind of stuff while we're underwater. Johan also, he uh, took the lead on planning today's dive. So the Ooh, kind exciting. of digging into the, the historical reports from Hurl and then looking at the maps on you know, what the objectives, kind of the broad objectives we had for testing the camera, but then picking the specific points and the why we're doing this and why we're doing that. That's so all, no uh, pressure on you, Johan, to make yeah, sure that you picked all. it all right. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's all based on the best information that we have, right? Yeah. So, Which is uh, the whole was, point of exploration. Yeah, you get exactly. down there and you just go for it and see what you can find and really hope that it yields something, something good. So this, the 2006, the University of Hawaii and the... Uh, Hawaiian Pacific University were out here last 
and did a dive and gave us some really good detailed notes that we're going to head back and hopefully be able to um, add to. The yeah, those uh, we purposely selected one of the canyons that's adjacent to those previous dives just to kind of explore a new spot because we looked a number of those previous reports were very similar, you know, from canyons to the left or canyons to the right. And so we thought maybe we'll uh, put on our, our true explorer hat and go to some place that no one's been. There you go. Before. That's how you do it. Isn't that right, Robert? Yeah, uh, I'm Robert Waters. I'm the hurt pilot this morning. Uh, I just want to say that I am very happy that we have had very few problems on this leg and this is our last leg for this season and a good way to end it yeah oh interesting factoid here is that oh. uh, one of our my former co-worker at woods hole oceanographic just is, is doing a spacewalk at the iss today oh cool yeah, laurel, wow. laurel o'hara she was a engineer at at Woods Hole, working on Alvin. Wow. Very cool. Is that something? Will they broadcast that? Oh, I'm sure it's live. Yeah. Be awesome yeah, to check that out. Yeah, on NASA TV, I'm sure. YouTube. Can we watch that from the ship? We can watch the spacewalk from the ocean. Cool. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've from been inner in space to outer space. Several times. Cool. <laughs> inner That's space very cool. to outer space. That's awesome. Guess I'll go next. Yes. Uh, <laughs> my name's Human Moeen. Uh, I'm an ROV engineering intern, and I am the pilot for Atalanta right now. And uh, when I'm not here, I'm a mechanical engineering student at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. I was talking to you today about what has been, or uh, was that yesterday? I can't, gosh, time's clicking together on me. Um, how cool was it working on at Atlanta there and being the ROV operator? Are you enjoying it? Yeah, it's definitely been super cool. Um, it's been fun, like working with everyone else and you know figuring out what everyone needs and like the the teamwork aspect of it is, has been really enjoyable. Awesome. And that leaves but one. The last one. The last. The best for but last. But the best for last. That's, That's exactly right. what I was going to say. Uh, my name's Pete Thorderson. I am uh, the video engineer on this morning's watch. Um, so my background is broadcast engineering, but I also have a geotechnical background. Uh, so, you know, a couple of ties to um, being on a ship. Um, lots of cool instrumentation and electronic things to geek out on, especially uh, last uh, July, we were on Ocean Networks Canada expedition, and so a lot of cool tech and instrumentation on the back deck for that. Uh, so I was just having a good old time. Good, just enjoying so, it. Yeah, get to nerd out and be the dumbest guy on the ship. So I uh, talk about being self-conscious about being the dumb guy in the room. No. This is the place. So if you have problems with that, this is maybe not the best place to be. <laughs> But uh, anyway, having a great time, blessed to be here, and uh, yeah, looking forward to what we're about to do for the next few days here. And Pete, you're controlling our satellite feeds, is that correct? Satellite feeds and the Zeus camera that's on Hercules. And so okay. um, we, uh, we have a couple of different camera systems on here. Um, Zeus is the um, kind of the eyes of the ROV pilot. Uh, so when we're um, zipping around, we kind of leave it the way it is, and then every once in a while we zoom in on what's uh, beautiful to look at, and then um, on top of that, on this expedition, we have the uh, Triclops Wide Field Array Camera System, so we'll uh, put that up on uh, Channel 3, uh, or Sat Feed 3, um, as, uh, as it's a good time to do it. And on Feed 1, just so that uh, the public knows, are they're looking specifically from the eyes of... That would be Hercules. Hercules. So feed one is always Hercules, and unless uh, otherwise instructed to route something different down there, or if we're just uh, not in a dive, you'll see miscellaneous deck cameras. And uh, channel two or sat feed two is um, at Atlanta, which is the sled that uh, is tethered to Hercules, and that yes. uh, 
you'll see that often zoomed in or wide focused on Hercules below. So that's how our co-pilot um, can kind of make sure that um, Atalanta is where it needs to be. It's a very important camera operation. And then three, uh, for satellite three, we'll ba bounce back and forth between our map, our orbit mapping, and um, the yep. control center here. Yep, yep And mostly. then our quad camera covers all three. So the quad is generated on shore. On shore. Yes, so the quad is done by um, Jason. Maybe you know the facility that um, our, all of our signals are going to. Yeah, so it goes through the Interspace Center at the University of Rhode Island, and they, they basically, uh, it's uh, the three feeds that we're sending out, plus they add a map that a has Nautilus's location yeah. on it. Yeah. So, so quad comes from, I had a question asking about that. So the quad comes from the University of Rhode Island, from our Interspace Center. So we have three um, low latency, um, high definition camera feeds that, that, that uh, beam via our onboard uh, satellite system. We have two sources of internet, which is exciting. We used to only have one. We have a CKU satellite antenna that uh, keeps track of the geostationary satellites up in space. And then we recently have been um, testing out Starlink. So we have what we consider our primary and backup internet sources. So That's good. That's good. Yeah, shout out to the University of New Hampshire Coast Center for Coastal Ocean Mapping for allowing us to continue testing with the Starlink after last expedition. They brought the Starlink antenna out with us and, and left nice. it on board to allow us to take advantage of that capability. So, uh, Johan, I had a question here. I feel like you might be the best person to answer this. Someone would like to know when Hercules and at Atlanta are diving today. Do they travel straight down or do they travel at an angle? And if so, could you tell us about the process in which you would decide how that would be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the pilots can speak to some of that, but uh, from my position and my role in it, uh, when we are launching the vehicles, we usually track a line forward. So we have the ship moving at some speed and that allows us to safely have Hercules behind the vessel more easily um, so that we can get Atalanta off the ship um, and get down and we usually continue that for the first 50 meters of descent and so during that time Herc and Adder are kind of pulled by the vessel as it goes uh, on whatever track that we have set or chosen uh, at that point we kind of hold position and then once we reach about 200 meters, uh, we start moving the ship slowly back towards our target site. So at that point, Herc and Atalanta are also moving kind of at an angle, mainly still descending, but slowly moving uh, through the water column laterally as well. And once we're kind of there and we're settled and we look at our maps and make sure Ada and Herc are going to land in uh, a good position and where we want them to, then we let them settle and then they descend straight down for the rest of the time. Awesome, thank you. Robert, do you have anything to add to that? Um, so when we're going up and down, uh, we try and keep the vehicles stretched out at the end of the tether, so they're rear to rear and at the same depth, you know. So, and then I try and kind of keep her pointed in the direction we're going to go when we get to the bottom, just so it kind of makes that process a little quicker. So you got that situational awareness with those tethers. Is it ever uh, challenging to keep the currents from entangling you? Yeah, you gotta you, <laughs> you gotta pay attention to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, guys. I appreciate that. that. was a great answer for a great question. So our expected dive time today is around 11 hours. Expected maximum depth is 1,720 meters. Our intent is to come travel down one of the canyon walls and then do an ascent upwards to 
continue to get some photogrammetry of the structures that we're seeing down there. And Captain Cameron has joined us. He's getting himself together, and I'm sure when he has a second, he'll chime in. Okay, I wanted to add too that, so on the astronaut thing, uh, yeah. we've actually had astronaut, at least one out here, work in the front row. And, uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. We pulled in the uh, Galveston, Texas, and she gave us a tour of the Johnson Space Center. We got wow. to go down on the floor in the command center, like that's pretty rare. You're normally yeah. up in that glass booth up above it when you do the tours there, but we got to go right down on the the floor of the command center and she was pointing out things on the on the space station and the the guy who uh, handles the camera there was actually panning the camera around to show us stuff awesome <laughs> yeah that's cool that's pretty a pretty exciting opportunity there it's kind of funny that you brought up uh laurel o'hara because uh like three or four years ago I interned at NASA. At and JPL? Uh, no, at Ames Research Center. Oh. And she did a uh, like a virtual presentation to the interns, talking about her story and everything, and oh. how she got there. And that was my one of my first introductions to um, submersibles and oh. deep sea exploration. Cool. Nice. So Connections. Kind of full circled. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. I think she interned at JPL. Is one of the one of the things you got to do as an astronaut, right? Yeah. <laughs> Check all the boxes. <laughs> so our focus on this exploration today is to uh, go and continue to explore the canyons north of Molokai. Um, our focus is to use the wide field camera array system so that we can continue to take. Uh, photogrammetry images and work with the immersive filmmaking in these canyons, uh, get some great images of the canyon walls, the rocks uh, that they're comprised of. We're expecting to see basalt and uh, carbonates, and we're going to use that all um, in a 3D programming that we're going to be able to put together to make an immersive experience. Um, it's going to be quite amazing once it's all done. All right, I've got a question that I can leave to my scientists here uh, in regards to water salinity. And I know that the deeper that we go, um, the more salinity that we're gonna see in the ocean, but someone wants to know why do they, they're noticing that there's a drop up to a certain point, but then it starts to rise again, the level of salinity. Anybody chime in on that? Yeah, and it's not, it's not really a linear thing. Like it, it doesn't, the salinity doesn't increase like in a linear fashion as you go deeper. So if you look at the sound velocity curves, they they have a bend to them. Yeah. You also have, you know, subsea currents, you know, you have yes. all kinds of mixing going on down there. So it's, you know, it, it generally hangs within a, you know, a range. Yes. It doesn't usually exceed, you know, a certain range. And but yeah, you have mixing that happens you know, from different sources and that sort of thing as well. And when you get currents that combine mm -hmm. and uh, make changes the yep. different, the level of salinity. I was just teaching yep. my sixth graders about currents and uh, temperatures and salinity and the density yep. that goes with that. So, yeah, perfect. Good. And one of my kids chiming in right there. Nice. Yeah. We're currently around 764 meters. Smallest animal you've seen in the ocean thus far? That's an interesting question. Uh, some of the stuff that lives inside coral is quite small. You can't see that with your naked eye, right? That's but true. they're there. They're, they're what kind of keeps the coral alive. 
and also some of the microbial mats we've seen near the vents also you've got some microbes and even as you're looking at satellite feed one yeah. right now mm -hmm. what we see is what we call marine snow we know that those are the same way we use, lose skin cells or pieces of hair fish and other animals will also lose those so you've got detritus that's in there but then also very small small forms of bacteria and things that are just and floating through that water column also larval stages of bigger animals so you see yep. that too in these Perfect. these areas as well so those would be those would definitely count as the smallest for sure <laughs> yeah absolutely so that on that former cruise there the mesobot vehicle was looking at all those things and what looking at all the individual animals in the water column. Right, the eDNA. So the, uh, that maybe that's really the smallest that you're looking at when they take yeah. the water samples and then uh, analyze to look at the DNA profiles that are in it's the water been column. It's fascinating to learn about that. I really, it is, it's an amazing thing. Can you tell us how eDNA is, is how, what, what it is for those that are listening? Yeah, so it's really just kind of a sample of whatever's in the water column, and they they extract it and they you know purify it and and just figure out what they're looking at. So you get a lot a mix of just everything's that everything that's there in, in the water column, and then you can identify it just through uh, looking at the DNA profiles. So it's very interesting. It is. It really yeah, is. Yeah, I don't know how they sort all that out. That, that's <laughs> just unbelievable. One of their, so I didn't, uh, I didn't know either, and we were talking about it on the last cruise because I was on with Mezobot and the eDNA team, and they, one of their, so they, they uh, on Mesobot, there's an in-situ pump that pumps seawater through and then filters out the eDNA, and, and when the vehicle comes back on deck, they simply remove these filters, the, and they're actually the mechanism that the filter attaches to the in situ pump sampler was uh, stolen from the AeroPress. If anybody has an AeroPress, oh, the nice. coffee, the coffee press. <laughs> yeah, the way oh, the the way the the uh, Makes sense. filter mechanism latches onto the kind of the barrel of the AeroPress yeah. is the same thing they use oh, on these wow. filters, just because uh, it was it's perfectly functional. So they twist off the filters, and then. Uh, because of the size constraints on Mesobot, they use the smaller filter than maybe the standard. And they were developing the, because the labs are used to, the labs that they send the samples off are used to the bigger filters. They were developing all these new unique ways of handling the smaller filters. And one of them was to put them into a blender and they mix, oh my. they literally okay. chop everything up and the eDNA is so small that it's not affected by the blending process. But then you get this homogenous kind of slurry, slurry of filter. Mm. Yeah. And then you can subsample it into the sizes you need and send it yep. off to the labs. And so they're, I think they're experimenting with that blender method <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> with some of our samples. Probably uh, pretty effective. Yeah. And then they'll, what they do usually is they extract the DNA and they, they amplify it. So like they do a, a polymerase chain reaction usually and the, to make more of it so they can actually have a better look at what's mm. there. So. Um, and then they put it through, you know, the normal kind of DNA uh, analysis. But it's also interesting to think of the things that we can do with science. It really yeah. is. It's cool stuff. We, we handle a few of the samples differently to preserve RNA. And I'm not okay. really hip to, yeah, yeah. you know, the particulars, but... Uh, it's just diff different chemistry that happens on the back end. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. it sounded like... Yeah, they use a... It's called RNA later that kind of freezes the... The metabolism of the sample, I guess. Oh, okay, cool. And it's what I was told was it's it's like super salty water. Like <laughs> okay, interesting. That's cool. But it was, so we also had the deep autonomous profiler, this big lander, and the lander was just uh, had 24 Niskin bottles, right? Mm -hmm. And then we f would f take these water samples and filter them yeah. on in the lab, and you can keep that water filtering. Like, <laughs> yeah. what a pain in the neck compared to simply going to Mesobot and, and yeah. untwisting these in situ samples. <laughs> yeah. So it was quite the, it's quite the advancement. And, and our a nice little jelly there. Yeah, Oceanic Labs who built the in situ sampler for Hui. Um, there's there's a number of these kind of in situ samplers getting out into the field now, and so I can't wait to see the results coming in from all over the world to try to understand what's going on in the water column because it's it's a very unexplored.
Yeah, the sample prep can sometimes take longer than, usually takes much longer than the, the actual either experiment or um, collection of samples, <laughs> at least in my, my experience. Yeah, we had to have an Instacart run on one of the personnel transfers for more bleach because they do this like <laughs> immaculate scrub down of the wet lab just yeah. to make sure that the samples are all Yeah, that you're not sampling yourself. Properly that's that's handled, always, yeah. you know. We've got greetings from Austria. Wow. wow. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. And also, we have a really good question. So when these samples are processed and there are uh, DNA that we don't have an identification for, could that possibly mean that there are species out there that we have yet to recognize? Yeah, I would say absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we certainly don't know everything that's in the ocean. And, you know, DNA is actually a really good way to, that's one of the ways that we uh, learn more about even animals that we can see and know what they are. Sometimes there are different species and that's a way that they, they can be defined. Um, and that's obviously been new in the last, you know, however many years, like 30 plus years. Um, that's not something we had before. It was mostly like what the forms look like or colors or that thing. So this is, you know, taking that sort of to the next level, being able to, to figure out even more detail about the organisms that we have been studying for years. It's I'll kind of exciting to think about that there's something out there that yeah. we've yet to label. I'll agree with Kristen that it could be something that we, a new species, but also the ability to trace, e to identify from DNA what the critter is, you need this catalog, right? Because you need to be able to say, okay, I've got this eDNA signature, and then it matches this thing in the catalog, and that's how I say that that's the critter that was there. And we're still building the catalog for oh, yeah. the ocean, right? It's, we're way it, behind. It's, it's, it has to be gigantic. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of the challenges. The catalog's just thin yeah. for some of this. Yeah. Yeah, so and when you think about things like microbes, like they're, they, they change so quickly, too. I mean, things kind of yeah, work constantly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Lots of mysteries still to be solved in the, yes, in the ocean, for sure. For sure. Lots of exploration still to be done. And we are approaching the end of uh, our two-week expedition here. Uh, we have two more dives mm -hmm. scheduled with this expedition. I'll take us through November the 5th. And then there's another um, expedition after this one. It's the last one for the year. There's two. Or yeah, two more. So the okay. next one is... Uh, is primarily a mapping expedition. They're going to go to this little sliver of the US EEZ that we've kind of cheekily referred to as the Hawaii Crescent because it looks like the shape of a crescent roll that's unmapped but yet in the US EEZ. And so that cruise is partially sponsored by BOEM. Uh, and it'll, it'll also have on board the Deep Autonomous Profiler. And so the, they'll map and do a few of the profiler deployments to assess the seabed and then I'm not sure about they are going to do some water sampling just because the I know they're chasing around the CTD and the the rosette firing mechanism that was damaged on the last expedition so a little bit of robot a little bit of mapping on that one and then the final expedition of the season is a purely mapping expedition uh, and I'm not sure where the mapping target for that actually is Jarvis Island. Is it Jarvis? It's Jarvis, yeah. yeah. So I just went to, um, and for anyone that's interested, if you went to nautiluslive.org and you looked at expeditions, it will give you a list of all of the expeditions that we've done for the 2023 season uh, and Hawaii mapping November 7th through 17th and then Jarvis Island mapping November 19th through December 19th. So that one's going to be a whole month long. Today. <laughs> oh, no. So yeah, we keep those updated for you on nautiluslive.org and then next thing you know, we'll have the 2024 season out and another set of expeditions to continue. So two more for this mission and then on to the next. Just makes me uh, wanna give a shout out to the team at OET for, for how well they look after the ship and the systems on board to be so productive, you know, just months and months and months of work. And then they basically uh, take the holiday season 
off to give the people a rest, and then the ship's right back at work. Yeah. And um, for how old the hull is of this ship, a lot of it's been kind of gone through and replaced. Uh, just an um, amazingly productive uh, platform. And it is because of the leadership of, you know, Allison Fundus as the chief operating officer and the close watch of Dr. Ballard um, that, that keeps it all running. Dedication and commitment from everyone, for sure. Yeah, the ROV team switches from operations mode to engineering mode. That's when we do all our uh, upgrades and maintenance work is over the... Bob, what's on tap for this season? So th this season, we have some big hydraulic mods that we're going to do, and possibly new manipulators. I don't know where the status of that is, but definitely new hydraulic manifolds and control for the hydraulic system. And you were... You were kind of telling me as we were going through a little tour that those are smart yeah, valves. What is that? What's the smarts in it? Well, currently we have all the valve control electronics are in the main model, the main electronics bottle. And so there's a lot of wiring that goes from the main electronics bottle out to the manifolds to operate the, the valves, the servo valves and stuff for the hydraulic system. And so the new manifolds have uh, just power and data going to the manifold and the controls right in the manifold. So oh, okay. It reduces the amount of wiring in the vehicle. And I like getting rid of wiring because it's that's where we have our problems. Is always you know in connections. And then we were talking the other day that the manipulator change. You said those are almost plug and play with a little bit of cal calibration. Yeah. Yeah. So if we do get it, I think they're planning on a new uh, craft manipulator, and that would be a yeah, really quick changeover, and then we could keep this one as a as our backup. So we currently don't have a backup for it, so mm -hmm. we have lots of spare parts, but it can, you know, depending on if, what the problem would be, it could take a while to fix it. Yeah. Is that manipulator arm made specially for Hercules? <laughs> no. It's you can buy it off the arm. shelf. Yeah, you can just we, buy them. I think we have the <laughs> oldest operating <laughs> arm in existence. <laughs> I think we have serial well, number one. But <laughs> when it when it counted, it was doing exactly what it needed to yeah. do. Yeah, Got it's, caught it, up the other day. We've, on we've kind of learned a lot of the tricks of the trade there to keep it going. So, Bob, I'm, what are the other manufacturers in stuff like this? I mean, folks, I'm truthfully I'm not that familiar with. Yeah, um, our other arms made by a company, ISE, and then. Um, and then the, kind of the, the industry standard arm is uh, is a Schilling uh, T4, which like Alvin and Jason both have two of those. Uh, that's sort of a, a workhorse arm. It's titanium and it's heavier than, than the arms we have. And it's also more money. So I don't think we're gonna get one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Would something like that be too heavy for Herc? It's it's a bit on the heavy side, yeah. I don't think you'd want to support that. I mean, it's the, I like the craft manipulator myself. It has a <clears throat> has a better control over the gripper, so you can like we can pick up an eggshell with the with the craft manipulator if we set the you can set the grip force way down. So in order to try and do that with a say the the T4, the Schilling T4 arm, you have to, the, the grip just stops in a position and it's got full beans there. It's like, you know, rock crushing power and you're just stopping it in a position. So if you just go a fraction of a millimeter too far, you, you know, you break things. <laughs> Is that a feature that they've designed because in the oil and gas applications, they need that sort of strength and not delicacy? Yeah, yeah, they're more parts. like, you know, turning valves and yeah. You know, holding big pieces of pipe and stuff. Yeah. So it's a it's a stronger arm. You know, it has more uh, yeah grip force and and uh, it can pick up heavier loads. But I don't think it's a really a great match for us. So. I've seen some of the. Uh, 
We also get great customer support from Kraft because one of the one of the leads at Kraft is he's addicted to uh, watching Nautilus live. And so oh. <laughs> <laughs> if I was to talk bad about the arm, I would get a I would get an email. <laughs> I was just going to say, I've seen some of the sampling that's taken place when they've used the claw, and it is quite impressive at how delicate it actually can be. Um, you don't really know the extent of uh, yeah. how well something's going to handle itself once you once you clip it or once you remove it from its environment, but the fact that it's able to be so delicate is quite impressive. Yeah, even the, uh, you know, when we had at Atlanta wrapped in that, that derelict fishing gear that that one rope just the ability to cut the rope and then and yeah. pass the knife from one manipulator yes. to the other it was it was amazing to yeah, watch that happen spoke to the the quality of the piloting and Absolutely. the ROV operator but also the capability of that manipulator Norbit has spotted him in sight about one two zero meters away Roger. <coughs> we don't have Doppler beams, but yeah. <coughs> so yeah, we got to wrap up the talk here, so we uh, get situated on the bottom. Is it rude to acknowledge the wrapping up the talk by talking? Or I was. Yeah. I literally <laughs> yeah, wanted I just, to say just, for those of you mean, at like, home. Nip it right now. I, yeah, I, I did. I wanted to just kind of put the end for those of you at home. You hear us go silent for just a little bit. We're getting very close to the bottom. We're just trying to get everything set up, and I just want to rush in to get that in there so everybody knows. <laughs> I was debating saying okay, but I was like, uh oh, he just told me to be quiet. He's a bit no, I just <laughs> wrapped it up. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. It's great. Hang in there with us. <laughs> Oh, there's got to be a skit in that somewhere, you know, somewhere. Yeah. Too funny. Four beams. Awesome. So again, we're not going to the bottom. We're going to stop at 30 meters or 35, whatever it is, for the Norbit, right? Yeah, I'm not sure if he wants 30 or 35 today. But. Jason, is that what we want? We're not going to the bottom? Sorry, uh, go ahead, say again. Sorry. We're, we're going to stop at Norbit height. We're not going to the bottom, right? Yep, stop at Norbit height, and then we'll Norbit our way down right. to the first waypoint. Yeah, thanks for the confirmation. Switching right. to DVL. There was conversations yesterday about us using Norbit as a verb. Yeah. Resetting. There you are. Data lab now. Chris, do you want three zero meter height or three five? Okay, great. So settling at three five. Three five. bearing should be zero four seven degrees yep. once we get going that's too many degrees
Okay, are you guys good? I can live with it. <laughs> All right. Chris, are you ready to start the survey? Yeah. All right, great. I'll get the ship moving. Bridge, bridge, nav. Can you please track a line at the bearing 047? Copy, thank you. 0 0.3 knots, please. Robert, we should be coming down about a 40 degree slope to start, so okay. it might be a little steep, but then it levels out a little. Did you see the 40 degree slope is going up or down? Down, down, down slope. Okay. So I think I'm going to wait till you're more on top of me. So we can tilt the camera down until we get, you know, I don't want to do it all stretched out if it's going to be down slope because you'll be dragging along the cliff. Yeah. So, so we'll have to adjust the camera angle a little bit. But do you want to add like a 45 or um, even further down? We'll just, we'll just go like so that Okay. I'm just... We're almost on top. Sounds good. You may have to come up a bit so we're not running into it with the football float. Okay. Come up to 18. Yeah. Uh, up six.
Thank you to those of you who are joining us. We're just getting ourselves set up into position now. Okay, so no more tilting the camera. I'll try and keep it center screen there. Sounds good. And we're and off. The delta, do you want it to be around 15 to 18? Uh, just, yeah, don't don't stretch it out. Just keep the float from hitting us. Got it. So you could come down and give it, so it doesn't yank on it at all. So that's probably, yeah, 17 to 18-ish range. Okay, we are all set with our survey, on the move, things look good, and we're going about 700 meters, so it'll be a, be a while of blue water.
We're currently around 1,277 meters, getting more of it all set up. Chris, when you have uh, an opportunity and feel comfortable, we have a couple of people that are requesting that you explain this process and what they're looking at. We'll wait on you for that. Hey. Um, but Will, so I did walk it over to the line a bit, so that was, yeah. That was just, that was, uh, yeah, that was just to line it up better, but I kind of overshot it. But <laughs> Okay, uh, well, I could, let me see, I'll, I'll try looking at the gains again, yeah, the gains the same, so, should be okay, I think that was just me, but I'm leaving it alone. That's for you, Chris. <laughs> the survey is going to be important because it's hopefully going to give us insight into the what are we missing kind of targets. So the site, we know we're going to be in this canyon. We're going to, we know we're going to explore this big rock face, potentially 300 meters tall. but. The outcrops is what we hope to see in the Norbit survey, and that's where we could potentially find corals or these other things that, that normally we just might not have. You know, we have a limited range on the sonars that are on the vehicle, but this multi-beam sonar gives us even a further ability to look out, and it's still within the range that we can excursion to to explore. And so we're hoping that Chris is able to tee up a few targets for us that'll add even more richness to the to the dive. 
And having the, had the opportunity to uh, work with and talk with Chris several times now, I can tell our viewers, those that are asking, that the color shades that they're seeing are uh, basically the returns that we're getting from the sonar itself. And uh, the warmer shades, as he describes them, are closer to the surface or, or closer to our, our mapping system. And then the ones that are shaded in blue are, are deeper. So we're able to get a really good uh, look at the landscape. Uh, as it is below the ocean there, and then it actually turned, or below the, um, the mapping system, and as it turns out, um, just basically do a little topography of what the area is looking like. Yeah, so we get a real-time snapshot, and that's what folks are seeing on Sat Feed 3, is the different types of data that are coming into the system. And we can, we can say, oh boy, look at that feature right there, but then there is 10, 15 minute delay while Chris processes after the survey's over before it gets loaded into kind of our navigation system and everything's perfectly aligned where we can use that information to target uh, a specific feature. But for operationally, you know, when we complete a survey, say like we are today, we're coming down this slope, it takes a minute for the, it takes 10 or 15 minutes for the ROV to settle out, the vehicles to get in a position, that first ship move to get kind of put into the the ship's dynamic positioning system. And so by the time we're ready to go, Chris has this map like loaded up and it's actionable. And so it, it, it fits in really, really well with our kind of ops pace here. And so we're lucky to have Chris on board to be able to operate this system. One of the key things I think we need to, to fund Chris uh, to develop for us is the ability for the other navigators, the other folks, the, the mapping team, to be able to operate and run the system just like we are out here because we're, we're yesterday's dive was the perfect example of its utility we we had some general targets there was notes of uh in these precious coral beds that that there was large outcrops around but we didn't have that specific point and so we used an orbit to find structure and boy we went right over to this first outcropping that we saw in the orbit multi-beam and it was exceptional we spent most of the dive there you know it really made it pushed this expedition over the top before we had we kind of checked the boxes we collected footage uh, at each location but we hadn't had this awe-inspiring visual and uh, yesterday the, those corals were really really fantastic and and we would have spent hours looking for that site uh, if we didn't have the Norbit system I couldn't believe how detail the Norbit data is. He was setting centimeter scale. Like that's yes. amazing that, yeah. they, that yeah, you we can see that. At, uh, from some of the cracks there. Yeah, the, yeah, the fissures yesterday. That. Yeah. yeah. Quite interesting. <laughs> to be that precise. Yeah. Yeah. With that level of tracking, makes you wonder if the fisheries in Alaska could benefit from something like this. Yeah. Could count crabs. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I was just thinking, I didn't want to say it out loud because I didn't want to embarrass myself. But the, <laughs> if, if we go over what would be, it's like kind of the student chiming in, like if we go over the six gill shark that had been noted in the reports before right. with the Norbit, would we see... I mean, we see fish in the water column, so I, I would think that we could see something as, you know, like a, a shark or whatever. I don't know if this is the shark spotting tool we should employ, but. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cheating. <laughs> <laughs> These are questions to ask Dr. Mayer on the next watch. He's the, got the acoustics background. We've got England joining in, wanting to know more about that Nor uh, Norbert. And as soon as Chris gets to a place, it, it really is fascinating to hear him explain um, how this system works. And as soon as he gets to a place, he's, he's going to join us and explain 
uh, everything that you're seeing in satellite feed three. It really is worth uh, listening to his explanation. He does it much more justice than I could. We were talking to Chris up on the monkey deck on, last night, and he said that we were asking him if he could put something other than Hercules in there. We were, we were uh, in the in the model. You can see Hercules at the top there. And he, we were requesting a, like a, a Halloween costume for a Herc. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would have been so appropriate. He said that someone asked if he could make it at a, at a rubber ducky. He said he could. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. Look at this. Uh, <laughs> there, there there's goes. the ship. Yeah. Chris is probably still catching up. He got up at 3 a.m. this morning to join me on a on a live with two oh, classrooms. Wow. So he went back to, to sleep right after. But uh, lucky kids this morning. Then, yeah, huh? for sure. So are we happy with the uh, with the uh, heading wobble there? Yeah, I think I'm pretty happy with everything, Bob. Okay. We have a little bit of wiggles going on in the depth it, there in the. Uh, it, it could be uh, some current maybe at play there. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. We have like we have some low frequency wobbles in the in the the depth measurement, but I think it's probably okay. Okay. Like when I actually like look at the data, I don't see he too many heave artifacts or anything. So, okay, it's a little hard to tell in here, but you know. And Chris, whenever you're comfortable to explain um, what we can see here on satellite feed three with Norbert, we have several people that are requesting that explanation. So whenever you're comfortable. Yeah. I think everything's pretty stable. I think I can go ahead and talk about it a little bit right now. Awesome. Um, one second, let me get resituated so I can grab the mouse and hold the talk button. Uh, all right, so what we're seeing here, right now I have a set up as a top-down view. So you can see here, this is where Nautilus is. You can see Hercules right there, little tiny dot, right? Um, you can see the incoming data, the data points. This white line here sort of represents the latest data points. This golden shaded area represents the last 10 minutes of returns stacked up. Uh, and they're actually colored by backscatter. Uh, so areas that show up brighter have basically a louder echo. You can think of them as being like brighter, like a, like a brighter color. So you can see over here, we had a few like rock outcroppings or something, and they show up a little brighter. And I think we're largely over like a sedimenty bottom. Yep, so it looks pretty consistent otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, and we're starting to see a little bit of an edge come in over here. So after we do that, let's go to a different view. Let's zoom in on Hercules. Yeah. So here we are. You can see right here this big blue uh, fan. This is what the Norbit, the raw Norbit water column data. So this is what it sees. This is basically the area that it's scanning. This is the hard return that we're getting. Would this be where we would see the six gill shark if we passed over it, Chris? Yeah, and actually we can. Uh, thing, fish and school, schools of fish and other critters we can see flying through the water column there. So you can kind of, it's like a cat scan, right? You can see them come in and fade out as they go through. Cat shark scan, says Rennie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Norbit is actually mounted right here on the vehicle. So you can see that's where the, the fan is radiating out. Uh, as we zoom in, yeah, you can see our returns. Chris, one thing you haven't maybe spoken about on the previous description of this is the shape of the uh, multi-beam array, the, the barrel array, and why that's helpful for you know kind of yeah. our mission. So there's two ways, two ma main ways to make a uh, multi-beam array. You can have what's called a Mills cross, which is just two flat arrays parallel to each other, or you can have what's called a barrel array, which is uh, a single flat transmit array, a linear array, and a 
uh, and a curved receive array. And what the curved receive array allows you to do is have an extremely wide swath, right? So you lose a little bit of resolution near the center of your array over the flat array, but you can have an extremely wide swath. You can see it's set pretty wide here, but this can actually be set beyond 180 degrees. Uh, I'm not going to do it right now because I don't want to mess up the survey data, but uh, but yeah, you can survey up to uh, maybe like 210 degrees. And that actually allows us, to, and we can also steer it left and right. So we can actually, one of the reasons that Norbit is mounted up on the corner of the vehicle like this is so we can actually like look up and out this direction. Right, we can see up and look at actually scan the undersides of cliff faces and overhangs and stuff, without having to physically remount the vehicle, or without having to physically remount the Norbit on the vehicle. So yeah, that's really a major advantage of this type of array over others. Yeah, thank you. And then the other screens that you have, you're showing on the sat feed. It looks like you've got the yeah that one and the yeah. Two so that's the water column view. That's the same as this fan that we see here. It's just d displayed in more of a 2D array, and you can actually go ahead and take measurements off of it here. So if you look as I move over, it shows the cursor location. So this is very useful if it's in like a forward-facing array. So we could actually orient it like this and pretend like Norbit is looking out and forward. And we would often use yeah. that as a, uh, as a way to find things in the water column. So we okay. often use that for like methane seep hunting. So Norbit is very good at seeing like bubbles and things like that in the water column. How what they was the ring? What they was, what was the results from uh, the at the vent site? Were we able to? Did it confuse the Norbit? Were we able? No. To see so I don't. The, you know, the venting wasn't super strong, and it didn't really seem to have that big of an effect. Okay. Uh, and places where I've used the Norbit before, at venting sites, uh, we didn't actually get a return, but we got a hole in the data over the Norbits or over those sites. And if you think about it, there's a lot. The venting has a lot of crazy changes in sound speed, which causes the beams to refract and sort of scatter. So they, it's like it's kind of like looking into a fog. So you just don't see anything back. So even the absence of data in that case, we Is can kind of yeah. yeah right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we were to find a vent, there would just be a big tear in this map. And we could use that to say, hey, that's interesting. I bet there might be venting there if we know we're in a location of of venting. Yeah. But yeah, in terms of seeing it in the water column and stuff, we didn't really see much in the water column other than just like the bottom disappears. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I, the last element of this is the, uh, this is the gridded data. So it's, we can't really keep all of the raw points forever. It just loads the computer up and it has a hard time rendering it and keeping up. So we simplify it into a into a world model, uh, and if we zoom in on this, you can actually see that this is like a mesh. Yeah, it's a simplified mesh, and it's a lot easier for the computer to uh, represent and store in memory than all of the all of the points. And it gives us something sort of easy to look at, right? It it's easy to interpret visually. So the top, Chris, of that of each grid is the shallowest point or the deepest yeah, point? Yeah, this is the, the red red colors represent shallow, uh, cooler colors represent deeper. For, but for each of the um, the grid squares, is it an average of all the points? Or it's, is it yes, it's an, it's an average of all the points. So if we look at it top down, you can kind of see, let me zoom in, because you guys have a little bit compressed video. But yeah, each square represents the average of all the points that fell inside that square. Okay. Uh, we actually have another way of this, and this works great for uh, what we like to call 2.5D data. So data where you don't have like overhangs or very strong vertical structure. Uh, if you have something like a cave and you take the average of all the points in the cave, like if you average the, the ceiling of the cave, the roof of the cave, and the floor of the cave, it'll just make a mess, right? So we actually have another way to do that. And instead of using pixels like we did here, we can use voxels, so let me turn those on, there you go, and we can represent things this way. So if we zoom in, you can see that these are actually cubes instead of squares. 
So we lose a little bit of vertical resolution when we do things this way, but we can represent truly vertical structure. Um, yeah, and this is sort of the, there, we, we get a lot of like Minecraft comparisons yeah. and that's actually very astute, right? Like this is, this is exactly the way that Minecraft represents the data in terms of, uh, in terms of voxels. And they do it for the same reason as we do. Yeah, what a tool. I, I, uh, I know that it's been so well received with Dr. Ballard, how helpful it is in targeting, you know, things to explore that it's going to be hard for <laughs> OET not to put this into our normal processes, you know, because Absolutely. it's just been s such an efficiency gain and turned out with such positive results. So kudos to Chris for all this custom software. Yeah, I really love uh, seeing it used. And I don't know, one of the things that I find most fun out here is developing a new tool, uh, spending a lot of time and effort on the beach, developing a new tool and coming out here and using it to explore something totally new and figuring out, oh, well, if it could do this, we could, you know, we could see this new thing. And working on these features iteratively is really exciting to me. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate From its it. mounting point, Chris, how, I know you said 180 degree view, but how many meters out are you actually able? So about the farthest that we can see with this system is uh, a little over 200 meters. Oh, wow. And that depends. We can see things like direct on, like if, we, if, the, if the beams hit, it, hit the surface directly on maybe like 230 meters. And the more oblique the angle is, you can see how out here it starts to fade out. Uh, if you hit something at a very grazing angle, you get a very weak return. So it, 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 it really depends on the angle. But yeah, I, I would say 200 meters is a good estimate of range. That's yeah, you can see so you can being. see that we're starting to get some we're starting to see a big cliff here. And all of a sudden, we're starting to get data points down here. Yeah. In real time. Yep. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Anytime. If if we had a camera in the data lab, I think Chris has got like one leg stretched over hitting the talk yeah. button on the, <laughs> the box and the other arm on the opposite corner of the lab with the mouse, so Thanks, Chris, for stretching out for us. We can fix that with a headset, Chris, if you'd like. <laughs> I just yeah, don't. it would probably be good to have a headset down here when we're doing this, but uh, this is not the worst. Then you're tethered there forever. <laughs> That's right. I like to be able to run around. He needs, he needs the pack. Put the pack on. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. the belt pack. Give him a pack, yeah. So it's just amazing the things like we're using the technology to build this map. Uh, we could, we could also, and Pete, you don't have to do this, but we could swap to the the modeling computer, and they're building the models from yesterday in um, reality capture. It, it, Pete, it's not there's nothing that super exciting going on, but I can see them working in the background, and so the, there's just a lot of new technology that we're um, demonstrating, we're really pushing to find the limits and the challenges with on this expedition. And then you layer on top all the different unique places that we've been visiting. You know, here we're gonna we're gonna dive in these canyons today, and tomorrow we're going to these submarine wrecks that were scuttled after World War II. We were yes. at these coral gardens. Like it's been all over the map. It's almost uh, it, truthfully, it's almost too much. Like the variety, <laughs> like it's awesome the variety, but. Uh, it has, I wanted to, I would want to spend more time at the site yesterday, you know, and I think we're going to leave the submarines going, man, I could stare at this for hours, you know, thinking oh, through the sure. history and the, you know, even these submarines tomorrow um, had aircraft on board, right? There was an aircraft, a hangar built into the top of these submarines to carry up it's the two massive. custom aircraft to launch. Then uh, these were s aircraft launched from a submarine to go hunt other submarines. I just, uh, I can't wait because we're going to have some ah. historians and uh, marine archaeologists join us tomorrow and hopefully they can fill in, you know, all the, the details on these targets, but it should be epic. Yes. Um, so we have, and we'll be diving on that site for two days. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so th Thursday. Three different City submarine Thursday? wrecks. So we'll, de we'll, we'll visit two tomorrow because they're close by each other. Right. On the same dive. And then the following day on November 4th. Uh, we'll we'll have uh, 
about a six hour dive to uh, on just one target. Nice. So definitely worth sticking around to. Um, and even a new back. piece of new piece of technology on that November fourth, we're potentially going to have National Geographic Sun Sphere, this like ball of light that we're going to use to illuminate the rack and film with it on the seafloor. Oh wow! So yeah, we're just like every trick we have on the ship, we're throwing it this we're expedition. It. <laughs> there's, no, there's no switch left flipped, no electron not. Consumed. I saw that. The sun sphere last night kind of looks like the ball they drop on New Year's Eve. It does. <laughs> it definitely does. Jason, do you know the name of that computer that's on KVM? Uh, I think it's TRI. T R I. We've got some STEM classrooms joining us. We've got uh, friends from England. Um, we've just, are just racking them up over here. I appreciate so much everybody joining us and, and listening and learning um, here, here. about our mapping systems. And we will, uh, this is the beginning of our dive. This dive is expected to last uh, 11 hours, at least, uh, what are we at, at least 10 more. Um, so nine and a half more hours so we've still got a lot to see uh, we like to lead off with uh, mapping and, and get that going and then we'll move into uh, some of these canyons that the mapping is uh, going to be graphing and start to look for other things to see johan how much time till we waypoint one uh we have about 400 425 more meters, which uh, means maybe another 40 minutes-ish. Okay. I, I think that's the real testament to this watch, is we set the other watches up for success. We like, do, <coughs> every <coughs> single time. Yeah, we get the data in the bag, we, we get, get the leg work done, yeah, right. get it all going. Then they waltz in and get that's to do yeah. all the fun stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, there's pride in that, right? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. I may never make Ran the highlight steps. reel, but oh. <laughs> set it up for those that could. Good kind of. <laughs> we did drop them into a nice place yesterday. It is. It's a team effort. It's, yeah. It takes for all sure. Of us. A little shrimp there. A little shrimp, little fella in there. Yeah. Popping by to say hi. There's my highlight reel right there. Look, he's sticking oh. with us. <laughs> And then we get comments like I just received now, just saying that how um, our friends from England are just, they're learning so much by just listening, mm -hmm. um, getting Chris's explanation of what's going on and uh, valuable information that we get to share. We appreciate you guys hanging out with us and being a part of this. And some more friends from Wales. Thank you guys for checking in and letting us know that you're with us. We appreciate that. So this wall that we're uh, seeing in the Norbit, this drop off is is what the targets we're going to come back to and explore along. So this is really good insight into the first couple of features that'll be our primary targets. Yes, as you look at satellite V3, uh, that smaller image on the left, the one in the red uh, down at the bottom there, you can really see that drop and then that, that slope that starts to take place uh, that leads up to this starting to figure it all out now, now that we're at the end of the mission.
Now, Chris, if you have an opportunity to answer the question, someone's asking if we found anything unexpected with Norbert. Norbit. I wanted to say Norbert. Norbit. Just one second. Yeah, so, yeah, just yesterday, um, on one of the survey maps we were doing, after we finished our photogrammetry for the day, we had uh, about an hour to go cruise around, um, and we used the Norbit to, we followed a big ridge line that was visible in the Norbit map, so we went straight there, uh, and that turned out to be pretty cool. It was a good uh, spot for corals and stuff, but we also found this, like, about 50 centimeter wide, two meter deep crack that just went that was you know maybe a couple hundred meters long uh went right to it um fall and used the map to follow it along and it was just filled with uh octopus and fish and corals and yeah it was just a really interesting feature that we probably would have just breezed right by other words otherwise thank you for that yeah we we were we were talking about that earlier how uh incredibly precise that was at 50 centimeters uh, of a crack in the in the floor there, so it was uh, quite impressive to know that we could identify things using Norbert that are just that small, uh, but that it picks up on on the feed. Impressive. <laughs> uh, not quite. And we are continuing on to that. We're going all the way to waypoint one. Uh, how far is that? 360. was that? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, so we're looking, Rennie and I are down here looking at the uh, at the map, and we're wondering if that's some columnar basalt action right there. Hmm. That would be pretty cool. That's about what we were seeing, the depth range. For yeah, that, I mean, that looks like That it. looks about right, doesn't it? Oop. There's the water column. Yeah. Yeah, and you can definitely see these sort of like linear shapes in the in the in the point clouds, the linear terrace shape, yeah. Yeah. I think we might have found a dive target. Awesome. That's right by waypoint two. So that's perfect. quality of that detail is just amazing.
We've had a lot of flexibility when it comes to new discoveries here with the missions that we've been on and things that we've been able to see. Um, we've extended some dives, so even though we come in upon things unexpectedly, uh, we've been went pretty good at um, adding things to the list and uh, still getting the mission accomplished. So. That just speaks to the flexibility of the team here. Like everybody is working hard, but when there is this idea, could we try? What about? Right. The, that's why we're all here. Like those special like collaborations to, mm -hmm. to bring the new thing to together. And so we've been really, really successful with it on yeah. this hitch. That's a great question. Thank you. thought you weren't into those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm into them. Absolutely. I can't help myself. Uh. <laughs> but I don't think I need four. Uh. Just one. <laughs> So we are at the beginning stages of this particular dive and we are working uh, on our mapping at the moment. We still have probably another maybe half hour of our mapping and then we'll be moving into um, the canyons of that are just north of Molokai. And one of the, I'm looking at some of the hurled dive reports from a canyon uh, to the east of us, but here on the north side of Molokai. And some interesting things noted, um, large band of columnar basalts at 1,500 meters, so. Here it looks like we were just getting those images that perhaps so were too. part of that. Yeah, you can see that that streak, the long, yeah, Chris is helping out. Yeah, he but was showing us those formations that yep. could very well be. And so the depth there, maybe Chris can chime in, but if that's uh, 1,500 meters, that's that's exactly in line with what we saw on some of these other targets. According yeah, it looks like uh, 1,480 or so meters depth yeah. for those. Yeah, so this report, large columnar basalt at 1,500 meters. Yeah, so that's close. And then it then it describes very undercut, creating broad overhangs, which I think from a like an imagery perspective of the geology might be really... Like yeah, we could have overhangs like in this bit right here. Because yeah. like we can't see the direction we went over, we wouldn't be able to see under the cliffs with the with the transect direction. So they, these guys could be, they were definitely very steep at least. Yeah, so then it describes some pillow lava, pillow flows, a layer of carbonite. So we could have some color differences, you know, as we're looking at the uh, oh, yeah. sediment with a black crust. Um, it looks like Terry Kirby, the hurl pilot, was on point with this report because he actually used this extra section for equipment deficiencies to keep describing the uh, what he saw in the dive. Uh, let's see. Lots of discussion about sediment covered valley floor, silts, clay slopes. Again, more basalt at 1,437 meters. And... Uh, Basalt dike layers covering a layer of basalt conglomerate, leaving the bottom at 1,400. So I think we're at the, these are like the perfect depths. We're going to see hopefully all these things. And, and from all of these reports, they all noted similar things at similar depths. And so this being an, an unexplored canyon, you know, I, hopefully we do benefit from that, that intel uh, and see some of the stuff at those same depth markers, 1,500 to 
1,400 meters sounds like the sweet spot from the geology perspective. Had someone asking about the Halloween costumes and how how that ended up with the contest. I think the ship as a whole was the winner. We had some fabulous uh, participation. Captain Camera, our Mantis, can we, our gnome. Can we tell the audience the story of the Operation Pumpkin and and just the, comp the f how funny? Yeah. So you know, I've actually gotten several uh, comments in regards to the pumpkins and and. Hindsight 2020, had we done it all over again, scientifically, people were saying, did you weigh them before and then weigh them afterwards? Oh, good. That was excellent. Yeah. 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 So that would have been interesting. But we did. We, we were able to strap some pumpkins uh, down on the deck there of Hercules to uh, just kind of run a little scientific experiment and allowed everybody at home to kind of chime in. They thought it would implode or explode or saturate and um, turns out they they came back exactly as they left us which was interesting no so changes i think it was a gourd those are gourds right were they gourds i i thought they were pumpkins they were they I, not I baby I don't pumpkins have, i don't know i don't have a are they the same thing? I, I don't know. I just know your pumpkin will like rot on your front porch within I weeks, a month or something. <laughs> but a gourd, that thing, the snow will melt in the spring and you'll see, see, a, see a gourd like sitting on the steps. They also dry out really easily. Yeah. Like they like, yeah. Okay. But the, the most disheartening thing about the whole so originally, the way this was schemed was we we had a personnel transfer and we, we had a couple of volunteers that were going to go to uh, the grocery store in Kona and pick <laughs> up a pumpkin, bring it back to the ship. And this is what's going to kick off this whole experiment, right? Right. So that was the plan. was sold out. The Walmart was sold out. And they came back with only this small bag of these decorative. We did a four and a half pumpkins. mile trek. Oh, yeah, you were. Yeah, 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 four and a half mile trek and, and, and through waves and, and uh, yeah, for these. Uphills both, uphill both ways? Yep. Uh, uphill both ways, absolutely. We went around <laughs> and came up to, yeah. Um, the smallest ones that we could possibly. I just, I kept looking for them thinking there was, there's got it. And then I'm just realizing while well, I'm on the island of Hawaii, there yeah, were so plenty of pineapples, right. but uh, yeah, pumpkins were not available. But so you went through all this effort. We right? did. And then we get the, the uh, you were so focused on the mission that yeah. you brought back these gourds, trying to make something, something happen, right? Something, yeah. They have to be in the same <laughs> family, so right? We put them on the ROV, and the next, like, the ROV goes in the water, and we come, like, we're on watch. We, we are, we don't know what's going on on the rest of the ship, really. And we get off shift and uh -huh. go into the galley. And the ship apparently had a pumpkin on board the yes. entire time. They had carved it, <laughs> yes. it out decoratively on the yes. table after you walked all over town, basically. That was, and, and that pumpkin was my dinner date that night. I sat right in front of him pondering my oh. whole day and what it is that I had set on track to do. And there he was all along. Oh, that was funny. I laughed so hard. It's always, always important to consult the galley when it comes Absolutely. to food You know, <laughs> we should have asked. We yeah. should have asked. Should have. Oh. I walked by and it was just you and the pumpkin at the whole table. By yeah, yourself. it was my dinner date. <laughs> it was. It was just. It was just me. <laughs> uh. Just me and the pumpkin. I took a picture of it. And somebody had carved it very well. It was. It was nicely carved oh, and yeah. cleaned. And and then we had pumpkin soup last night. I think. Uh, which was delicious Ooh. from the pumpkin itself. Was it a little salty? 
<laughs> Might have been the one that we sent down and you came laugh. back up if it was a little on the salty side. You laugh, but there now there if you've seen if you're a, a uh, I think it's a whiskey or bourbon connoisseur. They have the these whiskeys now that are out on the vessel, like out on oh, the yeah, ship. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jefferson, are. Jefferson Reserve. Not that I would know that firsthand. No, I don't know. How, how did you know that? I don't know. I guess. <laughs> but apparently they're in the barrel. They're out at sea, and the sloshing of the Yeah, the age better. Yeah, uh -huh. right. It's probably a bit of marketing, but I'm sure there's something yeah. to it. Yeah. And then the same thing with wine. I just, I had heard recently that there was a California winery that was bottling their wines then putting them in the deep ocean and they got fined by the state of California for like some environmental oh no uh, they didn't have the proper permits to do what they were doing but but when they would they would recover these wines after months and months in the deep sea and then sell them for a premium because of the uniqueness of whatever uh, happened with the there wine. There you go. I wonder what that would taste like. So I guess I was, I mean, Pete, you were joking, but I was guessing that we could have maybe a, a gourmet pumpkin <laughs> soup like <laughs> from our experiment here. But. So we're just, Randy and I are just talking down here. We found, you take a look, there's this big pit that's showing up. Oh, look at that. Yep. That's, uh, so that might be something interesting to check out on the way up. Definitely drop a target there. I wonder if that could be like a landslide yeah, or something. It looks like there's some... It looks like there's some hard, rigid formations and stuff down there. Yeah. Are you able to get a read on the depth of that? Sure. Stand by. Everyone's typing in and telling me all about the difference between gourds and pumpkins. It looks like 1,580 now. meters to the bottom of the pit. 1,580 meters to the bottom of the pit. Interesting. Yeah, and it's 15.7, so it's, yeah, the pit's maybe 10 meters deep. So, uh, Pete and Johan, maybe when you're done inputting this target, can you... Uh, Maybe zoom out a bit and and uh, expand just the map. And then, Pete, can we share uh, Johan's screen on Sat three? Yeah, the nav. Yeah, and I just yep. well, and we can maybe set it up because you can see how unique the seafloor is, and the reason why the Norbit's so important because the target that we're now seeing is something that we really would like to explore. And if you switch to the, so this is the existing map that we've been working on, and, and Johan, maybe you can drive us around and zoom in where the ship is and where you think this target is in the map. Sure thing. If we zoom in on this area, we can see this is Hercules here with Atalanta right behind okay. and the ship tracking its line, and then just estimating off the map, we placed this little rough pit target okay. location. So this is, geologically, this is interesting, these sorts of uh, high relief areas or dramatic changes in the seabed attract, you know, they, they alter the currents, and so that attracts life to these areas. And so these are things that we want to explore. And just by going off of the bathymetry that we had before the dive, you wouldn't have known this existed, and now here with the Norbit, we're we're gonna we're gonna go to the first waypoint, but we're gonna make our way as efficiently as possible, probably to to right here and start our exploration. And we wouldn't have had this sort of insight without the Norbit. And Pete, you can go back to the Norbit now. Thank you for that switching around. Yeah, so in Sat V3, you can see the the feature that we're talking about, but just the power of the doing a little bit of really high resolution mapping before we dive can dramatically affect the results from our ROV dive. Absolutely, this technology just really enhances the exploration and allows us to really learn so much about yeah. 
not just the terrain, but like you were saying, how that alters the currents, and what type of organisms it would bring in because of that. No, so no beneficial. No, it's going to be like. No, but, but it's our best bet, right? Yeah, that's all absolutely. Chris, do you, uh, Data Lab, can you give us a feel for the scale of this, uh, the pit? Is it 20 meters across or 50 or 10? I guess I was, my thought was is if we map this with